Now, we're talking about a, a general cognitive planning facility, right? The guys who came up with this whole thing about the state space and this tree and duplicate states and nodes and G values and all that stuff actually were psychologists, believe it or not. Like, well, one of them was actually in a, got the Nobel Prize in economics. Um, he was interested in how people are like totally not rational. This is the basis of a lot of economic theory is that people do the right thing, but people demonstrably like don't do the right thing. Um, so, uh, so I have this the quote that I showed last time from some psychologists talking about general cognitive abilities and about rep mentally representing aspects of the world, projecting them out into the future. And that's exactly what these search trees are doing. You're thinking about what's the state of the world going to be like in the future. Not now, but in the future. So when we talk about, about generating a node, you know, one of these nodes, this is the mental act that's fundamental to planning, which in my humble opinion is fundamental to intelligence. Like someone who like can't take into account the fact that something's going to happen in the future, like is not being that smart. Like, I don't know, I'm very impressed when I meet people who can actually take significant actions now to deal with something that's like a year away. Um, those people are planning. They're exhibiting intelligence. And that's what this algorithm is doing when it unfolds the state space. Um, and generates these states that are in the future. So that's the foundation of planning. That's what we're covering this first couple weeks of the class. Uh, whoops. All right, we've talked about how to represent the vacuum world. These are the folks. This is Herb Simon, Nobel Prize winner. This is Alan Newell, cognitive psychologist. They're studying chess. They did all these, these, uh, these um, studies of grandmasters in chess, and they found out all kinds of just amazingly cool stuff. Like if you show a grandmaster a random chessboard, they're totally not good at remembering it. They're just as good as a novice chess player. Unless the board is a possible result of legal chess moves, in which case they're far superior to novice chess players. But there's something about their mental representation of the board that's done in terms of things that actually happen in chess games. Uh, so they have all these fabulous studies uh, about problem solving in chess. Um, so Newell and Simon, Simon and Newell are credited with this thing called state space search. People sometimes harsh a little bit on Simon because he said in 1961 some very grandiose things about like AI is gonna like be able to do everything that people can do within 20 years and something like that. And you know, it's definitely past 1981, and there are lots of things computers still can't do, so therefore this Nobel Prize winner is an idiot. Ah, I, he did a lot of great stuff. The fact that he was not 100% right, I certainly forgive him. Um, we talked about what states are. These actions that take one state to another state, those are also called operators. So like the vacuum operator. Um, and a state of the world that is one of the ones we want a goal. We've already been using that term uh, a lot. So these are the folks that, that started using that lingo when talking about problem solving. Uh, whoa, I keep hitting the wrong key. Okay. So here's a planning algorithm right here. We're going to take the initial state, wrap it up into a node, put it in this queue here, and then we're going to enter the wonderful loop of intelligence. Uh, we look on the queue. If it's empty, oh, we're hosed. Um, otherwise, we take something off the front of the queue. If it's a goal, thank God we have a plan. Um, now, it varies about whether the state itself is the answer to your problem or whether it's the path to the state that's really the answer to your problem. I mean, if we go back to the state space here, for this kind of a vacuum world thing, you probably want the, ooh, I'll use a new color. You probably want the path, right, that represents going right and vacuuming. That's the solution. So each one of your nodes here, you have a choice. You can either store at every node the plan that got you there, or you can just store a little pointer back to your parent. Did you mention parent pointers on Friday? Matt claims he did recitation on Friday. In fact, I poked my head in and I looked like he was, was he, did he do an okay job? Okay, you ever have a beef with Matt, you come see me. 
Um, so parent pointers, good. So we talked about parent pointers. That's one way of remembering the plan so far, is to keep a, every node keep a pointer to your parent. Um, let's see. Uh, so when you decide, when you reach a node that's a goal, you either return the node or you trace back through the parent pointers and construct the plan, or you do something to return this this uh, this goal that you found. But if it's not a goal, then you expand a node. Expanding a node means to generate its children. Yeah, exactly, and um, push them on the front of the queue. So what what uh, what algorithm is this? Raise your hand if you think you know. Priya. Exactly, step first search. Um, so initially, this node is on just this initial node's on the queue. You push that node off, then these three nodes are on the queue. Um, then maybe we'll choose one, pop it off, pop this guy off, then these guys go on the front. So then the, the queue is going to be these nodes here. At every, t at every time, the algorithm has what I like to call the search frontier. It's also called the open list, the nodes that are open to being explored. Um, they're, they're nodes that you could expand. Whereas the nodes you've already been to are closed. They're in the closed list, which is that hash table that we use to remember duplicates, to detect duplicates. So these are in the closed list, and these guys here are on the, the, the open list, on the search frontier. So that's step first search. <sighs> yeah, it is. Absolutely is. Yep. Um, yeah. Oh, awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Is that the next is that the next slide? Yeah, right there. Add children to the end of the queue. And that becomes breadth first search. Exactly. Brilliant. You guys are, this is a good class. You guys are right on top of it. Um, okay, before we get to breadth first search, though, let's just think for just a sec about, ah, I'm going to get used to these buttons someday. Um, is depth first search a complete planning algorithm? Completeness means an algorithm is complete if it returns a solution if a solution exists. Yes. Really? Are you certain of that answer? Depends on what you mean by solution. Uh, plan. If there, if, there is a, if there is a plan that achieves the goal, is depth first search guaranteed to find it? Yes. Is there a guarantee? Uh, we can look at the pseudocode again. No, I just mean uh, actually with with uh, with any with any time whatsoever, um, is depth first search guaranteed to to return a goal? Well, We're gonna cage fight here, <laughs> cage fight. <laughs> so so the 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 concern that I have with Lee's claim is that what if I'm a little robot, right? And there are a lot of things I can do. And and the the uh, maybe is a robot really the right example? Um, the, depending on our representation, let's say I'm a. Did you ever read Homer Price? Oh, classic book uh, about a boy in Centersburg. Uh, it's by uh, uh, David McCauley, I want to say uh, the McCloskey, Robert McCloskey. Um, Anyway, he, he ends up being left alone tending a donut making machine. And let me tell you, the donut making machine keeps spitting out donuts. So let's say you're a, you're a factory robot, right? The state space you're in is infinite because you keep creating new things, which can then go in all the infinite places, all, even if there are only a finite number of places in the world, more things being created. So this, there are an infinite number of possible states of the world. So this tree here has no bound. It goes forever. Because I can always create another donut. 
And then I can stack it in any one of the bazillion places. But a bazillion is a finite number, so I'm having to rely on the fact that we're always going to have a, yet another donut coming out. Um, so this tree is infinite. And even if it were finite, uh, it could be a lot bigger than the memory of your computer. But uh, to go theoretically, if we say the as long as the state space is infinite, depth-first search is incomplete. Because depth-first search could say, oh, OK, I'm going to expand this node first. Oh, I'm going to expand that node first. And keep going down, even if there were a two-step plan that rid the world of all dirt, depth-first search is not guaranteed to find it. Because it goes depth first. Down, 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 down. Nope. It's not. So if, if, the, if de the close list only saves you if you come to a place you've been before. Right, I, I so but if this is the push the make donut button, I can just sit around doing that and I'm still not at the goal. And I'm still not at the goal. And I'm, god darn, I'm still not at the goal. What's wrong? I'm going to push harder. It's still not at the goal. For example, yeah, yeah. that would be another example of an infinite state space. So um, if your state space is finite and you do implement a closed list, then depth-first search is complete. But if your state space is infinite, you are hosed. So, um, so these, little, these little details can sometimes be important. So depth-first search is not actually complete. Um, uh, there's this term admissibility, which means are you guaranteed to return the optimal solution? And um, seeing as we're not even guaranteed to return a solution if one exists, it's sort of moot about whether if we do happen to return one, is it going to be optimal? But let's entertain that question anyway, just for academic pedagogical purposes. Um, if depth-first search actually does manage to find a solution, uh, is that solution going to be uh, the shortest one possible or the, ch the cheapest one if, if our g-values are v-values? Adam's saying no. Why not? Um, well, we care about the last part, but the last one's sort of level by level. Level by level. Yeah. It's going to go down, and it might actually hit a goal, but there could be shallower nodes that it has not explored yet that could lead to goals, or that might be goals themselves. So absolutely. Uh, if you care about optimality, depth-first search is not your, your man. Um, OK, so breadth-first search. Um, complete? Yes. Admissible? Yes. Um, so that's, so that's good. Breadth for search is good. Now, if the tree has a branching factor of B and there's a solution at depth D, how many nodes is breadth first search going to visit? Yeah, B to the D. Uh, does everyone understand that? So um, if, bleh. here we've got the initial state up here. And if they're B, Children, so they're they're this is this is of size b, um, and then for each of those, they're going to be b children. All right, so we've got one b, and then this is going to have b squared children on this level, and then b cubed all the way down to b to the d. Um, so an exponential number of nodes in the length of the solution. So that's why breadth first search is, it's used sometimes, but it's certainly not my favorite algorithm. Luckily, we can do better than this. We can do better than b to the d. Um, now, it's b to the d in, in time and in memory. It's b to the d in time because we have to go visit each of these nodes. And if we say it takes one unit of time to visit each node, and there are an exponential number of nodes, that's an exponential number of time units. But it's also exponential in memory, because when we're just about to expand nodes down on this level here, we have, we've just finished 
generating this child, and we have to come all the way back here and generate this node's children. So we have to remember this entire frontier, right, which is exponentially sized. So exponential time and exponential memory, which is too bad. Now what about depth first search? What about depth first? I agree it's incomplete. Okay, fine. Um, but let's be pragmatic. I think Lee was trying to encourage us to be a little pragmatic here. What if we're in a finite space uh, and maybe, I don't know, maybe we're detecting duplicates or something. Um, we might, what, 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 what's the time and space complexity going to be? Let's say I put a depth bound at depth D. That would be nice. What if I actually knew the optimal solution length? I just said, don't go deeper than D. What's, what's roughly the number of nodes we'd be visiting with a, with a depth first search? Time. Let's, let's just focus on time for a sec. Worst case. Sorry? Mm, we're, so we're going to do depth first search. So we're going we're to expand this node, and then we're going to expand that node, and then that node. And we're going to keep going down until we've gone all the way down to depth D. And then we back up, and we go down and we visit all these nodes and all these nodes, and then we go back up. And we, we are, we're going to explore this tree in a depth first way instead of a breadth first way. It's a tree traversal. How many nodes are in this tree? D to the D. So it's still the same time complexity as breadth first search. Assuming we, somebody handed us the, the solution depth, which I can tell you is, does not happen. Um, but if someone did, then we'd have the same time complexity as breadth first search. But the big advantage is going to be memory. Um, oh. Kendall. Yeah. Um, shouldn't you assume it to take on average about half the time? Because B to the D over 2. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, I don't care about constant factors. Um, yeah. There's this whole thing about big O notation that I'm not going to talk about right now. But big O notation says let's ignore constant factors. So uh, so let's let's just say big O B to the D. And that, that, way, that way we're still in trouble. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so we, we have the same bad time complexity as breadth first search. But what's the big advantage of depth first search? It comes in memory use. What's the memory use of depth first search to be? Yeah, why is it? Well, yeah, it is. And why is that? The current path, the current path. Yeah, because wh the place I'm going to backtrack is one of the places on the current path. Let's see if I can draw that a little bit, slightly less messily. Um, if I'm doing depth first search, I expand that node, expand that node, expand that node. Let's say that I hit my depth bound. And I go back, and I'm just going to go and expand that node there. There's just this linear number of nodes um, for every depth, uh, every depth d, I have to remember b nodes. Because by the time I come over here and I start expanding that node, I can totally forget all this stuff over here. This whole subtree here, I can just forget about. Unless you're keeping a closed list, exactly. So. Um, a lot of times when people use depth first search, they don't use a closed list. So um, there's a special data structure people sometimes use, which is like a leaky closed list. So people call it a transposition table, um, which is it's, uh, basically just a fixed size cache. And if you generate something you've never seen before, you put it in your cache. And after you've generated cache size number of things, then you put something in and the oldest one falls out. <laughs> Um, so it's like a poor man's closed list. Um, so people sometimes use depth first search with a transposition table. But yeah, if you're not using a transposition table, depth first search is great because you just have this linear 
this linear space needs. Uh, Jonathan. Supporting assignments. Yeah. Is there an algorithm that we can use to estimate how deep to look with that search? Um, people have written research papers on that topic, but you're not required to read them and understand them in order to implement the assignment. So is that our own algorithm to calculate the depth? It's actually a finite space. So it's not going to run forever. If we don't implement a lookup table. If you don't implement a closed list. Uh, so this is a great question. So Jonathan's asking, um, is there some, is there some uh, middle ground between remembering nothing and remembering everything? I mentioned a transposition table, but there's even something a little simpler we can do. So you could calculate the number of cells in the world and multiply that by two, and that could be your rough upper bound on the length of an optimal solution. Ooh, you have to go back. Oh, ouch. Ouch, what if I, make you, what if I give you a, a maze world where you have to go through all the tendrils of the maze to the ends and then back to the starting state and then somewhere else? Anyway, you can. That's true. That's true. There's even there's so. But let me let mention one little simple thing, which I think, if you do this, I'll certainly be happy. If you want to be fancy, that's good too. Um, but one simple thing that people do, uh, if they don't want to keep a transposition table or a. a full close list, is they just do cycle checking. You just make sure that you don't move to a place that you've already visited on this path from the root. You don't get into a cycle. Yeah, we don't, in the state space graph, um, so here, you want to make sure you don't end up coming back to some place you've already been. So. You could keep, for example, a, uh, some data structure that remembers every state along your path. And as you go down, you add states to that. And then when you backtrack, you remove states from it. So it's like a linear space transposition table. You and you use it, use it to catch cycles. Wouldn't you still just make that as a test table anyway? Because that's just what you want. I would. Then I'd implement it as a head table. Then what's the point of doing that when you It's guaranteed linear space. Right, because you're going to be forgetting stuff when you backtrack. Right. So that's important. Makes a big difference. We've gone from B to the D to just B times D. Or actually here it's just B, or sorry, just D. Just size D. It doesn't, you don't even care what the branching factor is because these other siblings are not on your path. So big difference between exponential and linear. Okay, great. You guys are inventing lots of useful stuff. Um, ah, okay, this is the last algorithm I want to do before we get to the break. Um, I try and have a break halfway through every class, but we've already zoomed over it. Um, if you have a state space where the actions are, do not cost one, then breadth first search is no longer optimal, mm -hmm. right? Because there might be one action that's really cheap, one that's really expensive. So if your G cost represents the cost so far, then just sort your Q by G and always remove the node with lowest G from your Q. When you generate children, merge them into the Q, keeping the Q sorted by path cost. Does anyone remember another name for this algorithm? Excuse me? Nope. 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 It is named after a person. It does have a person's name attached, but it's not early. Some annoying Dutch guy. <laughs> what? Dijkstra. Dijkstra. This is Dijkstra's algorithm for shortest paths in a weighted graph. 
Because um, that's exactly what we're doing. We're building a weighted graph on the fly. We're lazily constructing a graph and finding a shortest path in it at the same time, which is totally cool. Um, people who took the algorithms class know what data structure the Q should be implemented as. Do you want to spill the beans for everyone else? A heap, yeah, because you're always getting the min element. Exactly. Um, so this is just Dijkstra's algorithm with an implicit graph. Um, so uh, you, in AI, we call it uniform cost search. Um, and it's going be it's going to be spreading out from the from the initial state. The search frontier is going to contain nodes that have approximately the same cost. Because every time they have kids, the kids are going to be a little more expensive. So they'll go, the, 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 the paths that are more expensive are going to go to the rear of the queue, and the, ones on the cheap ones are going to come to the front. So nothing's ever going to get too cheap or too expensive, because the expensive ones go to the end, and the cheap ones come to the front, and then their children get more expensive. So it's this wonderful equal, is it dynamic equilibrium that's maintained in this queue here. Can you Oh, that's a great exam question. <laughs> that is a great little, <laughs> yeah, I wish I could know the answer to that. Um, so uniform cost search, is it admissible? Is it, ad is it an admissible algorithm? Is it guaranteed to find the optimal plan, the plan of cheapest cost? Dan, you're saying something, but if it, exists, yeah. if it exists, why is that? Sketch the proof. No. <laughs> no? You say no? Yeah. Dan says yes, you say no. So the proof in my eyes really hinges on this. Now this is in the pseudocode here, it's a little underspecified, but um, the idea is that we're popping off the node with the smallest path cost and looking at it. And since it's the smallest path cost, if it's a goal, if there's another goal that's on the queue, it's more it's at least as expensive as this one. So we, we, we've got the cheapest plan here. This algorithm is admissible. Now, if you don't do this test here, if you did the test like down here, like test each child to see if it's a goal, that was... I think your original question, yeah. if we test, if we do goal testing at generation time, not at expansion time, is the algorithm still admissible? Is everyone following along with the question? Find admissibility. Admissibility uh, finds the cheapest solution. We're still going to be admissible. Nathan wants to know. Why not? Because couldn't one of your children be more expensive than something on the queue that's free? Yeah. Here's an here's a here's an here's an example. Um, so here's a node I'm expanding, node N. Yeah. Let's say we're expanding node n, and um, here's a node. Let's say this. Let's say n it has a g equals zero, and this edge here is ten bucks. So therefore, this goal here has cost ten. Uh, but here's an edge that costs one dollar, and here's another edge that costs one dollar. So this this here has a g value of two. Right. If I test at generation time, when I generate these two nodes, then I, I'm going to pick this and say, whoa, goal, I'm done, I'm out of here, time to go home. But the fact is the G value here is just one. Right? So you totally want to go explore this node further before you start getting so excited about this goal you found. So you have to do the goal test at, um, at expansion time. <coughs> 